Ohio AAP's lead prevention uh, program. Um, I'm also a part of the Department of Pediatrics at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and I'm the current chairperson of the AAP's Council on Environmental Health. Hello, my name is uh, Nick Newman, and I'm um, a faculty at the uh, University of Cincinnati and director of the Environmental Health and Lead Clinic at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Thanks for all tuning in today. Great, thank you both. Um, we just wanted to give a few um, updates. So we have been doing a lead quality improvement project for the past six months, it just wrapped up. Um, during this project, we focused on increasing the testing rates for all children in a high risk zip code or those on Medicaid insurance. We had 11 locations that participated um, throughout Ohio. And it was a great project and we have a lot of resources that were developed for that project. You can access them on our Ohio AEP um, website. There is a family rec card and a physician resource guide that can be used from there. We've also developed a lead toolkit. Um, you can see from the screenshot, there is a ton of information, EMR tools, program resources, how to implement it into your practice, um, testing, um, guidelines, trainings, and literature. This is for physicians, but it can also be used um, with health departments or other professionals that work um, in the lead field. So we also have a journal club with different modules on different literature for each month. You can either do this month to month or you can work at it at your own pace. There is 20 um, CME and 20 MOC part two credits available for this. And this also translates over to nursing credit. At this time, I will go ahead and let Dr. Newman get started. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. We're excited to share this information with you. And thank you um, again to ODH for your support. Thanks so much, Alex. Hello. So um, I just want to uh, briefly go over uh, today, we're uh, going to review uh, the epidemiology of lead exposure in children, um, look at um, the short and term, uh, short and long term implications of lead exposure, and then to uh, uh, start to introduce some of the anticipatory guidance and medical management recommendations. And that probably is going to be more of that's going to happen in the next, um, the next uh, uh, webinar. Next slide. So yeah, like so, uh, we're saying so today we're basically looking at uh, the epidemiology of lead exposure, lead screening, and testing, and then uh, next time we'll talk about responding to a positive test, uh, follow up management, and other resources. Next slide. So uh, COVID nineteen has created like all kinds of of uh, complications with primary care, and um, I, I just saw. Uh, just saw an article today that um, was talking about uh, the percentage of people in the U.S. who had deferred some kind of medical care, where you know whether it be um, the preventive care, so dental, eye exams, et cetera. And uh, one of the things that we saw uh, locally, of course, was a, a decrease in lead uh, testing as well as like all other preventive care for children, and. Um, we, um, I just did a, a brief um, a kind of back of the napkin calculation, looking at you know what had happened in Ohio, and um, you can see like you know in the uh, the large uh, cities in Ohio, and this is not meant to be inclusive. It was just um, uh, ones that I could quickly pull up. Uh, you definitely, uh, we've definitely seen some drop off over 2020. Granted, all this is preliminary data. ODH hasn't. Um, uh, hasn't um, finalized everything yet, but it, it certainly um, suggests that you know there's a good number of kids who are missed locally. And uh, this headline up here um, was uh, uh, in in uh, is it from the New York Times was in in response to a, a paper re recently written by the CDC that suggests about nine thousand kids with lead poisoning were uh, uh, missed during 2020. So. 
all the more important as uh, we're trying to re-gear up and try to catch up with all the other preventive care that got missed that uh, led for uh, the appropriate, popula you know, appropriate populations to be also checked. Next slide. So the framework that I think about, like most things, um, uh, disease, is this very traditional epidemiological triad. So basically this idea that there are host factors, there are agent factors and environment factors that uh, influence the development of disease. Next, please. And so, you know, for example, like cholera, like this is like the classic, right? So, you know, people who are old or young tend to be, tend to be like more uh, affected. People who are a little bit more dehydrated to start get sicker. Obviously, the agent is a, a bacteria and the environment, like, you know, some contaminated water is how it gets in. So next slide. And, um, you know, lead poisoning is a similar thing. So there are host factors that, you know, potentially are modifiable, but not age, obviously, but this is a risk factor, right? Um, um, lead itself, like depending on where it's coming from, um, it could be from paint, it could be from a parental work, whatever. And then something about the child's environment, like, you know, you live in an old house, but maybe it's not in good condition. And that's like allows, that's the environment mediator. So, you know, as we've been working with COVID all this time, like, you know, we can't do much to change the virus, but what can we change in the other parts of the triad to try to reduce uh, disease? And the same thing with, with lead, what can we do in the other parts of the triad to try to reduce uh, disease? Next slide, please. So what is lead? Um, so lead is a um, metal. Uh, it's uh, malleable, corrosion resistant, um, and it comes in a bunch of different forms. So like there's lead zero, there's lead plus two, there's lead plus four. And the plus two is the one that we can absorb. We've been using lead for various purposes for about 8,000 years we, as, 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 by um, like archaeology estimation. But um, as far as we know, like the first like report, at least in the Western like medical compendium, if you want to call it that, came from uh, the ancient Greeks in um, approximately 2,200 years ago, like describing acute lead toxicity. And the CDC actually refers to it as the first pollutant. Like it was really like the first thing that we pulled out of the ground or started to use that started polluting everything. And unfortunately, because we've been using it so long, we basically like covered the whole world uh, with it. Um, and obviously, Acute toxicity has been known for a long time, but it's only in, probably in the last 40 to 50 years that we've really uh, truly appreciated like the subacute um, uh, exposures and what they can do. Next slide, please. So uh, this is just to give you a, a you know just an overall. I, I, I'm kind of a history uh, type of person, so I think it's interesting to point out that you know there was this enormous production. Uh, pickup in lead production during the you know the ancient Rome and and um, and ancient Greece uh, because they were they were mining silver and you often find uh, lead with silver and so because it contaminates it and so all this um, as they're separating it out they're like oh gosh what is all this stuff oh we could oh it's lead but we can do something with that and so um, you know it got used in all kinds of things. Um, you know, it being plumbus, right? So like it was used by plumbers and made for plumbing and um, as well as a whole bunch of other uh, purposes. And um, we now like produce more lead like than ever in human history. Um, and you know, some of it's being still being dug out of the ground and some of it is uh, recycled, obviously. Right. Next slide, please. So just to you know, put in perspective, because people say like, oh gosh, lead levels have dropped so much. Like, why are we even worried about this anymore? And, and the truth is, is like, I, um, you know, if you look at uh, these uh, pictures here, so I, the one on the left shows like ancient people. So they estimated what the lead burden was in the body based on how much lead was in the bone. 
And if you just do one little click, Alex, I think a little animation will come up. Yeah. So that one dot is the amount of lead that people were exposed to about 10,000 years ago. And you know, the typical American in the late 20th century was exposed to the one in the middle. So like that's like at least hundreds of times more. And then avert lead poisoning is probably 10 or 20 times more. So um, it really kind of gives you a, a, an idea, like the, once again, this historical perspective of like lead really wasn't in the environment until like humans started digging it up and messing with it. And uh, in that way, it's toxic to everything. It's toxic to humans, other animals, plants, mitochondria. Uh, you could kill almost anything with lead. Um, next slide, please. So basically the take home point with these two slides is like exposure has dramatically increased over human history. Next slide. So where to find lead? So I'm moving around the little triad. Next slide. So common sources, like, and so this is looking at like children, right? So uh, lead-based paint is, is definitely up at the top. Uh, occupational take-home exposure. Then water. So like water, this is a very complicated relationship, but suffice it to say, um, we're not talking about like, uh, like sporadic um, failures of, of uh, uh, corrosion control, like what happened in uh, Flint, Michigan. We're talking about this low level, constant uh, uh, lead that slowly leaches out from pipes over time. And so because we drink so much water, that multiplies a small amount by all the water we drink. And so that's why that becomes a significant source. And then because it gets into soil and, and uh, other items, it gets into food, some foods, some uh, and spices, um, the um, toys obviously may be painted with, with lead, lead paint uh, or otherwise contain it. Um, and then there are a number of uh, traditional cosmetics and ceremonial powders that have lead either as a main ingredient or just an inadvertent uh, addition. And um, in the clinic I work in, so I get kids referred to me with, with elevated lead levels from all over. And you know, I've basically seen like every single one of these. And um, you know, in the last week, even like we've had uh, kids with probably four of them, four or five of them. So you know, even though we think like purely of of, of um, you know lead-based paint in the home, there are a number of other sources uh, that it could come from. Yeah, and about eighty percent of it comes from there. But like, there's another twenty percent that's all these other sources. So it's not uh, an insignificant contribution. Next slide. So the, um, the, the main way that, that um, we got all these lead levels so high in the first place was lead and gasoline. And so the lead and gasoline got spread all over the place. And you can see here, so this was looking at NHANES 1 and, uh, I'm sorry, NHANES 2 and 3. So NHANES is the National Health Assessment Nutrition uh, Examination Survey that CDC um, now is doing on a continuous basis, but initially they were doing it like on a, a, a sporadic basis. So, um, and this is uh, meant to say like, what's going on in the United States? So they had a bunch of kids and they measured their lead levels and people have been following this over time. And you can see as we, uh, in, the, in the blue line here is lead and gasoline. You can see as we've reduced the uh, lead use in gasoline, there was a corresponding drop in children's blood lead levels. So, you know, from the 70s of the average of about 16 or so down to, um, well, this was only went to the 90s, but it's, it's gone even lower, but, you know, uh, you know closer to two. So uh, nowadays, uh, the geometric mean for the US is just under one. So removing from gasoline and a whole bunch of other things, but gasoline was probably the most, uh, you know, single biggest uh, contributor in the past. Next slide, please. So uh, we talked a little bit about uh, parental occupations. Um, so construction, I would say, like of, of the families I see, uh, 
Um, and the, you know, the data would bear this out also. Construction is a big um, potential source. So like people working in renovating old buildings come home covered with dust and they, you know, bring it into the home. And um, just to put it in perspective, you know, we, we're measuring micrograms of lead. And um, I had a family a few years ago where they had to have a side of uh, their garage, like, you know, so it was an old garage. So it's not like this gigantic building. It was like a little like uh, garage and it was right next to the play area. So they had to have the lead removed. They took 25 pounds of paint off the side of that garage. So like in older paint, let's say, let's say it's 50% lead, you know, that's a good estimate for like pre 1950s paint. Um, so there was like pounds of lead that they took off. So like literally like, you know, probably a hundred million times more lead than it would take to raise your lead level. So it's, it's a wonder, like we don't have an even bigger problem. Um, you know, obviously people who work with lead at work, you know, explicitly, you know, like batteries, recycling, et cetera. But most of those work sites are actually fairly tight. Uh, there have been some like horrendous exceptions recently, but like for the most part, they're, um, they're pretty tight um, in terms of preventing exposures. Obviously, um, uh, other things that we run into, like people who work with metals, uh, welders, uh, police and military personnel, mostly because they do, uh, police uh, officers do uh, annual like recertification training and at a um, firing range. And sometimes they'll come home with dust. And we, we've seen that happen a couple of times. Um, plumbing, actually, it's kind of interesting. They found that um, replacing the lead service lines actually uh, can create a significant uh, lead dust hazard. And that's, um, uh, there was recently a paper about that. So it's not an insignificant um, source. Um, artists, glass makers, these are less uh, common. Auto repair um, or other like uh, even like aviation repair because they still use leaded gasoline at, uh, in um, propeller airplanes. Um, the, that can definitely happen. So next slide, please. So this just kind of breaks it down. This was from the AAP published a, a couple of years ago. And as you can see, like if you look at like the overall contribution, like what are all the things that contribute to the, the lead? So it, it's all, it all adds up basically, right? So if your kid's lead level is 10, you know, some of it's coming from dust. Maybe if, you, if they're old pipes, some of it's coming from the pipes. You know, we all eat a little bit of dirt. You, you know, it, it all adds up. But um, just click the thing if you would, Alex. But you know, of the you know of the sources we have to worry about. Um, I'm, oh, I thought it was like a little thing would come up. But basically, water, lead, and dust lead are the are the two biggest ones. Next slide, please. So um, the lead in the in the drinking water. So like, how did that get in there? So basically, the the main thing that we worry about is uh, the service lines. So. The main lines like in the street do not contain lead because um, the lead uh, pipes that in that diameter would collapse under their own weight. And so they're made out of some other material. And you know, in an old city like Cincinnati, like, and there are other old cities in Ohio, but I happen to know this old uh, river city the best. Um, you know, there are pipes made out of any number of materials, including wood, and uh, you know, you know, stuff that you thought would have been phased out by now, but it's the lines that come from those main lines that go into the house that are made of lead. And um, nationally, those were banned in 1986. Although regionally, some cities banned them earlier, um, as as they did here. Um, lead and plumbing and fixtures was allowed until 2014. So, like those fancy, you know, particularly brass. Fixtures in your house could contain uh, lead. Um, right now, and this is all like changing right now. The the uh, EPA has set an action level of fifteen parts per billion of lead. Um, we, we could talk about that in the Q and A if anyone has any uh, questions about. It. This is not a health based level. This is like kind of a consensus um, thing, and, um, and what it stands for is is a lot more complicated than like, just like an absolute cutoff. Um, 
And the current testing that they do is really to test the water system, not necessarily the water that you're drinking this morning. And so there's a lot of talk about how to improve that kind of uh, water testing more widely. Next slide, please. So lead in housing, like we, we said it before, like 80% of the kids are exposed that way. So, um, but two thirds of housing in Ohio was built during this kind of lead paint era. And so there's a good chance that if you're not, I mean, the, the, the play, parts of Ohio that basically have housing that, uh, predominantly housing that isn't in that range is in the, the ex-urban areas um, uh, outside of the, of the uh, major metropolitan areas. But, you know, there are uh, obviously the inner cities, the, uh, the inner suburbs, um, and then the rural areas of Ohio also have a lot of, of older housing. Next slide, please. So how, I mean, if we've known that lead was poisonous for thousands of years, how did all these homes get painted with lead paint? So uh, we'll just do a very brief history lesson here again. Next slide, please. So basically, you know, we discovered that lead paint specifically was uh, dangerous to children at the, basically the end of the 19th, early 20th century. And the European countries and Australia uh, actually started um, banning lead paint uh, uh, very soon after that. And it took a while in reality, because like, if you look at 1909, like what happened in 1914, like all those countries went to war with each other. So like, um, there were some bumps along the way. Um, and ultimately, in uh, 1922, the, the Europeans uh, passed a, a, a treaty uh, to ban uh, lead paint. Uh, that was around the same time that the National Lead Company in the US uh, admitted that lead was a poison. Um, and then over the next like 50 years, like additional um, uh, data like, was continued to be collected until in 1978, um, lead-based house paint was ultimately banned in the, in the US. Uh, next slide, please. So like right after the League of Nations decided that they were gonna ban lead paint, uh, you know, the, uh, the companies in the US became very innovative and decided that, well, we gotta sell this paint. So they, um, they basically set up this marketing campaign to market lead paint to children in the form of a paint book. And as you can see, it says here, like a paint book for, for girls and boys. And the whole thing is like these rhyming couplets and stuff, you know. Um, and then inside there was a book for the grownups. So like the, this was the first time that marketers had really like said, oh, well, if we can get parents to buy stuff, if we could convince their kids that they need to have it. And so um, the same people who came up with this brilliant marketing scheme actually later went on to market uh, uh, cigarettes. Next slide, please. So I'm going to pass off now to Dr. Ball, and she'll uh, pick it up for a bit, and I'll be back uh, near the end. Thanks, Dr. Newman. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, sounds great. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, and that was sort of a perfect segue to, to think about um, some of the historical context around um, lead exposure. And because uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time here talking about some of the sy systems issues, the, the issues kind of encoded in policy that, um, that have helped to um, sort of sustain um, inequities in lead exposure in kids in Ohio and beyond. Um, so the, the first thing I want to say is that, you know, we talk a lot about housing age and Dr. Newman mentioned um, sort of that era of lead paint, but it's really not only housing age, it's also about housing and neighborhood maintenance. And certainly in Cleveland where I am, um, it's not as if all of the, the neighborhoods with similarly aged housing um, are, are demonstrating equal risk for lead exposure in kids in those neighborhoods. And I think sometimes this is framed, unfortunately, as an issue that is sort of like placed on the tenant or the owner of the house. Like if you only maintained your house well enough or cleaned it well enough. And sometimes that narrative um, seems to sort of um, blame or rest on an individual or a parent. Um, but when in fact there really are some systems issues that, 
explain these disparities in housing and neighborhood maintenance. Um, so if you'll go to the next slide, please. Lead poisoning is, is sort of a perfect example of what we call an environmental justice issue. Um, and when we talk about environmental injustice, we're talking about the disproportionate burden of environmental health hazards on different populations. Um, children themselves are a vulnerable population. Um, they are uniquely vulnerable to environmental hazards of all kinds and lead is no exception, um, but also historically marginalized communities, those that have been discriminated against politically or socioeconomically marginalized, um, so minority communities, low-income communities are at disproportionate risk for lead exposure. Um, and in fact, non-Hispanic Black children have almost three times higher risk of elevated blood lead level compared to other populations. Um, next slide, please. I think it's important to acknowledge that there are um, systems issues and, and issues encoded in policy, as I mentioned, that, um, that underpin some of these disparities. Um, one example um, that I can share from Cleveland that affects um, many similar cities relates to this um, practice called redlining, which, as you may know, describes uh, policies from the New Deal era um, in which uh, neighborhood maps were color coded um, by the Federal Housing Administration to indicate um, risk for more relative risk for mortgage insurance. So red is the highest risk and green is the most favorable. Um, and um, th those uh, those barriers were really um, uh, designed to ensure and enforce and perpetuate racial segregation. Um, the Federal Housing Administration Charter actually explicitly recommended even physical barriers um, to ensure persistent racial segregation. And so these maps, um, these redlining maps, um, sort of reflected what became a pattern for systematic disinvestment in historically Black neighborhoods in cities like Cleveland. Um, and there's more and more data emerging that, uh, that demonstrates that uh, persistent health disparities map very well um, to these historic um, redlining maps because this generational disinvestment in redlined neighborhoods has resulted in persistent um, uh, health disparities, persistent disparities in exposure to environmental hazards, including, including to lead. Next slide, please. So I'm going to move around that epidemiologic triad that Dr. Newman introduced earlier to talk a little bit about the unique vulnerability of children um, to, uh, to lead exposure and lead poisoning. Next slide, please. Um, so there are a number of reasons why children are uniquely vulnerable to environmental hazards in general. Um, their physiology, their unique windows of, uh, of critical development, their developmentally appropriate behaviors specific to lead exposure. Um, there are some differences in diet that render young children um, uniquely vulnerable. Uh, infants who have um, sort of a limited diet of breast milk or formula with, um, with gradual introduction of complementary foods. Same thing with toddlers. Um, their diet tends to be a little bit more limited. They also tend to eat stuff off the ground. Um, they might put stuff in their mouth that's not food. Um, uh, it, so compared to older children adult, and adults who don't have some of those behaviors and have a more varied diet. Next slide, please. Young children, as they're crawling around on the floor, are putting things in their mouth to explore their environment. Um, that's developmentally normal in young kids. Um, for kids who are iron deficient, for example, even older children um, who might have pica uh, behaviors, that is going to be a risk factor as well. Um, for older children, I mentioned pica, but also developmental delay if children have persistent hand to mouth behaviors, uh, they'll be at higher risk for lead exposure. Next slide, please. There are physiologic differences in, um, in children that, uh, that render them uh, more likely to absorb uh, lead that they ingest. So um, younger children are more likely to absorb lead from the GI tract than older children and adults. Um, and that will be exacerbated in children who are iron deficient. And that absorption also tends to be higher between meals. If you click the arrow, I think there's a little animation here. So just um, to add that, um, in fact, infants and toddlers absorb uh, two to four times the amount of lead that adults do. Next slide, please. So what are the implications of lead exposure in children? Um, we'll talk through, through, through the, uh, the, uh, the, the signs and symptoms of acute toxicity, which are uncommon, and then sort of the, the, 
the concern that, that we think about the most, which is the um, toxicity to the developing brain that can have lifelong, lifelong consequences to children and adults. Next slide, please. So as I said, acute symptomatic lead poisoning in the US, thankfully is, a rare, is rare. It still happens, but it's rare. Um, I wanna just touch on briefly uh, the, the, um, the sort of what the meaning of the, the reference level for elevated um, blood lead levels being five micrograms per deciliter. Dr. Newman mentioned the NHANES survey before. Um, so the, the reference level, as, as you may know, is selected uh, based on NHANES data. Um, it is the level at which 97.5% of children under six have a blood lead level below the reference level. So it's over time, the reference level has fallen um, because the statistical prevalence of, lead, of uh, elevated blood lead levels has changed and that curve has kind of shifted. Um, it's also true that the only safe blood lead level is zero. And we'll talk about that a little bit, but the reference level is, it's not a, it's not a diagnostic or prognostic level. You know, sometimes I, I have parents who ask me, well, if the blood level is four, does that mean, you know, how many IQ points does that add up to? If it's seven, what can we expect, um, you know, over the course of the child's, you know, school career and lifetime? And, and, and so just this idea that it's not a, it is not a level that allows us to prognosticate for any individual child, um, specifically what their outcomes will be. It's a public health action level, but we know that the higher the level and the more prolonged the level remains high, the, the higher likelihood that the child will have, um, will have consequences. So there's no safe level, and we'll talk a little bit um, in a minute here about um, some of the data around quote unquote low blood blood levels um, and uh, impacts on the developing brain. Um, but just want to clarify that um, what that reference level actually means. I also get some parents will come in and say, oh, my child has ADHD. Can you check their blood level to tell me if that's the reason they have ADHD? That's not how it really works. Next slide. Um, so as I said, the, 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 the prevalence of acute uh, lead poisoning, symptomatic lead poisoning is uncommon. Um, but when it occurs, here are some of the signs and symptoms. Um, changes in mental status um, can be manifest as irritability, changes in behavior, um, headaches at very high levels, um, seizures, um, lethargy, and then abdominal pain and loss of ap appetite as well. Next slide, please. Next slide. So chronic exposure to, to lead, even in the absence of acute symptoms, we worry about uh, the effects of lead exposure on the developing brain. Um, we know that, uh, that lead exposure is associated with uh, decrease in IQ, so issues with cognition, issues with behavior and learning. Um, there's no threshold, as I mentioned, there's no level, uh, blood lead level that's safe. Um, these effects aren't reversible, although there, there are definitely some um, supports and development or, um, developmental interventions that we can provide to help sort of mitigate these effects. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, iron deficiency um, increases the risk for lead absorption, but also iron deficiency worsens the effect of lead because iron, de iron, iron deficiency itself um, is bad for the developing brain. Next slide. Just to underscore the point that there's no safe level of, of lead in the blood, um, there is a, a, um, an impact on decrement in IQ at all detectable blood lead levels. And actually the slope of that relationship is the steepest at quote unquote lower blood lead levels. Next slide. Looking at sort of, um, at impacts over the course of a child's um, uh, uh, sort of school career. Um, this uh, illustrates data that demonstrates that um, the risk of, um, of failing proficiency tests um, in school increases with increasing blood lead levels. Um, and this is from um, several years of data out of Michigan. Next slide. So that, that, that box on the last slide, um, just calling out that, uh, that at a blood level of 10, 
there's a 45% increased risk of failing standardized tests. And the three lines here are math, science, and reading. Next slide, please. I mentioned behavioral problems that, um, that of course, ADHD, there is a multifactorial um, disorder, but uh, lead exposure is a significant um, contributor that, that in fact, um, up to 25% of ADHD may, um, may have uh, lead exposure as a cause. Um, Antisocial behavior um, uh, is something that can be seen over the course of a child's lifetime who's been exposed to lead, increased risk for criminal behavior and incarceration as an adult. Um, and these impacts can uh, show up uh, again uh, 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 over the course of a child's lifetime. Next slide. Um, just to again, underscore the, the lifelong impact. Children who have elevated blood lead levels are several times more likely to drop later drop out of high school to fail to complete high school. And, and then again, over the course of that, of that young person's lifetime, high school graduates make 30% 30, 30 plus more in earnings over a lifetime. So the, the impacts from an economic and health standpoint stack up over the years. Next slide, please. I mentioned increased risk for criminal behavior and incarceration. Um, this is an article from JAMA Pediatrics looking at um, some of the risk factors that increase um, likelihood for criminal behavior and incarceration. And among them um, is lead exposure. Next slide. I talked about the earning potential of a young person over, life, over their lifetime being decreased um, uh, due to the effects of lead exposure. And at a, at a population level, these costs are enormous um, in terms of lost IQ and productivity, but also in medical costs, costs um, in special education and educational accommodations, costs of incarceration. Um, and in fact, if we look at the return on investment in just monetary terms, for preventing lead poisoning, which is really the goal um, of, of public health is to prevent lead poisoning in the first place. For every dollar invested, the return is, depending on sort of how wide you cast your net, um, to look at uh, the, 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 depending on the time frame and how many sort of contexts you look at in, um, in measuring that return on investment, the range in that return is from 17 to over $200. Um, and if you'll uh, click forward, Alex, um, the, just as a sort of a, a, by way of reference, the only thing that really comes close is uh, childhood vaccines have, um, have a significant return on investment. And if anything, lead poisoning um, is even more so. Next slide, please. So we talked a little bit about children, um, young children being among the highest risk uh, groups for lead exposure those who live in low-income communities, um, both African-American and Hispanic children, um, recent immigrants, especially refugees, um, pregnant and childbearing age women that, um, that uh, lead, lead exposure can confer increased risk for premature birth, um, the elderly. Uh, so this is just sort of indicating that there's a, a, a lifelong consequence for lead exposure, um, that there's an increase in all-cause mortality in, um, in adults who have a history of lead exposure. Uh, um, and there's an increased risk for cardiovascular disease and, um, and heart attacks in uh, adults who have a history of lead poisoning. Next slide, please. So kind of in summary, um, if you click forward, Alex, I think, yeah. So in summary, um, the, the effects of lead exposure are, um, are, uh, are multi, multi-organ uh, uh, systems. Primarily, we're concerned about the developing brain in children. Those impacts can unfold over a lifetime, can impact school performance, um, decrease IQ, increase risk for behavioral problems, increased risk for um, dropping out of school, for incarceration, um, and those, uh, those economic and health impacts compound over time. Um, and then premature, uh, increased risk for premature birth as well. Um, so again, there's no safe level of lead. Um, there's a huge return on investment for preventing lead exposure. And so it's about sort of mustering the, um, the, the, the societal and political will um, uh, to, to make those investments. So next slide, please.
I think I turn it over to Dr. Newman here to talk a little bit more about pathophysiology. So I'll do that now. Hello. So uh, thanks, Dr. Ball. So everyone just hang on through this. It's not uh, quite as boring as you think it's going to be. So, uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, lead itself as a metal and, um, you know, other metals that are plus two. And so one of them would be calcium. Uh, basically, lead uh, uh, basically kind of follows calcium around the body. So, um, you know, you saw on the, the previous slide, it said, you know, patellar lead and all cause more, you know, and mortality in uh, adults. So the, the, the lead that we get exposed to, most of it deposits into the bone. And then in, in children, because a little less is in the bone, like more is available for other organs. And so the brain is another place where calcium is used, uh, mostly for signaling. And so um, what happens is it, it mimics calcium and uh, like all, basically all metals, I mean, this is kind of my lumper way of, I'm not a splitter, I'm a lumper. So like, if, if you look at the, the toxicity of most metals comes from the fact that they'll change their valence state while they're in the body. And so what happens is that calcium stays plus two under like basically all like body conditions, whereas lead can switch, you know, from, four, from two to four, and uh, or two to zero potentially. Um, and so when that happens, some electrons start uh, floating around and that is what causes damage, we think. And so because calcium is used with some of the um, like pruning of some of the connections in the brain, uh, we think that may be part of the, uh, the pathophysiology, uh, at least that's what uh, the animal studies are suggesting. Uh, it obviously, it also interferes with heme synthesis. And what's interesting is like some of the same enzymes that are involved in heme synthesis are also found in other uh, cells in the body, particularly the brain. And so, um, and there doesn't seem to be a point where there isn't an effect from, uh, from, from lead. Um, I, like I said before, it's toxic to mitochondria. And in fact, uh, when they invented the electron microscope, one of the first things that people did was look at cells, right? And they looked at mitochondria and like, oh, wow, those are really cool. And then they're like, oh, well, why don't we treat them with lead? I don't, I don't know why, you know? And then, then they're like, ooh, they don't look very happy anymore. And so um, it, it also interferes with uh, energy systems in the mitochondria, the little pumps that keep everything going. Um, and I think probably one of the most interesting things is incredibly low levels of lead. So picomolar levels of lead, so like what was that, 10 to the minus 12, um, were equivalent to micromolar concentrations of calcium in like activating some of the brain enzymes. So like, so what's happening we think is, is that um, it's possible that lead may be triggering some of these um, systems at, at uh, levels below like where physiologically they should be triggered. Um, so like to, to suffice to say, we don't completely understand the pathophysiology. That's what I'm presenting to you. This is not like a done deal. And, you know, the other thing is, you know, it isn't like you could say, oh, okay, well, lead affects your brain. So we're going to give you some lead and then we're going to take a piece of your brain. Like nobody signs up for that. Um, and so a lot of this has to be done either with animals or observation. And uh, next slide, please. Um, but with the advent of more advanced imaging, we can actually look into the brain of people who were exposed to lead to see, like, how does this affect the brain? And um, one of the things that's, um, this was a study done uh, down uh, here by some colleagues of mine. Um, and th this was a group of adults who have been followed since birth. Um, they were a birth cohort of children at high risk for lead exposure. And so um, what, what they did was when they were adults, they put them in a scanner. And by taking like many, many pictures of many, many brains, they came up with kind of like, and I don't wanna say normal brain because like who knows what normal is. It may, reminds me of young Frankenstein, the, movie, the old movie. So like, Basically, they they came up with like 
what a typical brain would look like in terms of like size of different parts of the brain. And then what they did was they looked to see, okay, if we had a group of people who were exposed to lead, how do the, the, the sizes of different parts of their brains compare to people with a typical brain? And what we found was that in certain parts of the brain, particularly the prefrontal cortex, which is involved with decision-making um, and uh, impulse control and stuff like that, uh, was significantly different in size. It was actually smaller than in people who had like a typical brain that was not exposed to lead. And as you can see, there's a couple of different areas that were significantly affected and others that, that were not. But this gives us a slight insight into what the, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe where the pathophysiology is. They followed up with some other studies looking at uh, the internal network of the brain and, and other stuff, but I didn't want to overload the talk with too much, uh, too much of this. Um, next slide, please. So lead screening, and this is kind of an interesting, um, like splitting words, right? So um, the, um, I, it, you know, people will talk about, well, screening is all the questions we ask, and then like testing is something different. But it, regardless of what you call it, it's really more in lead, it's not really screening in the normal sense that like, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force to find screening. Um, it's more surveillance or case finding. And part of that is that um, the, a screening test is something that you do on everybody. Like all 50-year-olds get a colonoscopy. doesn't matter. Like, um, and you're looking for uh, precancerous polyps or cancer, right? And so the, the thing with, with lead, like lead kind of fails the screening test, um, the screening test test, because it's something that once you find it, you we haven't found a level that's not bad. So like you don't find someone in a pre-disease state. If it's there, then you've already had the problem. We don't know any way to completely reverse it, like unlike the polyp that, you know, that the, the gastroenterologist removes, and now you're not going to get a cancer there. Right, and um, the and like I said, it's not necessarily universally recommended. It's um, you know the Ohio Department of Health and most health departments are like, well, you need to you need to do this like screening procedure on people who are, are high risk. Next slide, please. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing it. So the the part of the purpose is to identify cases for which primary prevention had failed. And I would give, you know, I would serve up like Flint, Michigan as an example, right? So like, uh, apparently they weren't watching the water supply very carefully. And um, the uh, and in the process, somebody noticed like, oh gosh, it seems like we have more kids with high lead levels than we did before. And so that was an opportunity to point out the fact that the primary prevention, which was like proper tr treatment of the water had failed. And, uh, but for, for the, for the most part, the interventions are public health interventions, right? I mean, yeah, you could tell the family to put in a water filter on, but really like, you know, you have to worry about everywhere that you get water from. And so really it, you need a public health environmental interventions. And the goal in all of this with, with testing is to reduce the lead levels as rapidly as possible because the data would suggest that it isn't just like what your lead level was at age one or two, but like, how long does it stay there? And um, that is, seems to be the, the you know, the, the main issue. So there is an opportunity, uh, you know, for uh, secondary tertiary prevention. Next slide, please. So there are these screening questions, right? You know, do you live in or visit a house before 1950? And to be honest, uh, please click for a second, Alex. One click, yeah. So the problem with the questionnaires is they really don't explain much of, a, of the variance in the blood lead levels. So, you know, so you say to yourself, okay, well, if that's not really explaining this, like, why not? And part of it is like, people don't know how old their house is. I asked a woman, I knew how old her house was because I looked it up. And I asked her, so how old do you think your house is? She's like, well, it seems old, but not that old. So maybe it was built in 1960. 
I said, well, actually, according to the county auditor, your house was built in 1822. And if you looked at the picture of it, it was very clear it was built in 1822 because it was made out of like giant rocks that you can't even find anymore, right? And so people, if they don't own the house or even if they do own it, they may not have a really good grasp of that. And that is in part like where this fails. But the problem is, is like there's so many different sources, you can't possibly like put them on a, a questionnaire that could be easily done. Next slide, please. So in fact, like uh, Cochrane and other uh, people have done like systematic reviews and they found that these questionnaires really did little better than chance at predicting lead poisoning risk among children. Next slide, please. And the US Preventive Services Task Force actually came forward and said there was sufficient evidence to say that questionnaires are not useful. And um, they're still listed as something to do in the, um, in the uh, Bright Futures Manual, but I, I think there, there probably are better ways, and we'll talk about that in a second. Next slide. So that meaning, the ODH has this wonderful prediction model, and they've worked with academics over the years to refine it, and to come up with like who needs to be tested, and they try to base it on zip code, which um, is not perfect, because zip codes aren't a perfect predictor either, but it's something that you can easily work with. Next slide, please. So by state law, there's the zip code high-risk map, and then children who are, who are insured by Medicaid at age one and two. And if there are other things going on, like if there are children are otherwise high risk, let's say maybe they were never tested at one and two, or you don't know whether they were tested in one or two, I would test them because the data that we have locally would say that they're actually higher risk than some of the other kids because some of them have fallen through the crack. Um, if they're known to be living in uh, pre-1950s housing, or if there's some clinical suspicion of lead exposure, like grandma says, yeah, he's been chewing at the railing of my, my, my house, and we've lived here for, you know, my family's had this house for 100 years, then maybe you should just, you know, check it regardless. But, the, you know, the law requires, like, the one and two, if either Medicaid or living in a high-risk zip code. Next slide. So I'm just going to reiterate this because I think uh, that this is one of the issues we have. Is like we have probably 40 percent, at least, of the kids that are high, or that define at high risk, are, are uh, appear to be being missed. And so we we this is something that we can we can work on. And that's why we were doing the uh, QI project over the past year with the practices all around the state. And um, next slide, please. So testing. So like you'd either do that with a you know a capillary sample, typically like a finger or a toe, right? Or a venous sample. Next slide. And um, the so let me um, just go into that for a second. So the 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 issue really is like you want to know whether there's any lead like in the kid or ex the kids exposed to lead. And either a capillary test or a venous test will give you that answer. The Ohio Department of Health will respond. Uh, they, they, so let's say, let's say you have a kid who has a capillary level that's like six or seven or something. So that has to be repeated to find out whether there was actually like an internal dose. And um, the, uh, there, there's, there's a, a, a process that both ODH and the local health departments work on to, to follow up with the kids who are uh, exposed to lead. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but if, you, if you're doing laboratory, like all the labs that, you know, that we would normally work with, they are gonna report this uh, automatically to the, to the state because that's the law. If you're doing it yourself in your clinic, let's say you have a point of care device or something, you also have to report that. And this is stored in a, a central database. And um, the, um, the uh, ODH uh, updates this on the public data warehouse uh, uh, regularly. Next slide, please. 
So if this was from the uh, previous uh, targeted testing plan. So if you look, most of the state, like I said, except for some of the, you know, kind of exurban areas uh, are considered high risk. And so, um, you know, I, it, let's say you, you, you practice in, um, you know, Brown County or something like that. You're like, oh, there aren't any big cities here. I don't need to worry about it. Well, actually, kids in Brown County have a pretty high risk of having an elevated blood level based on the data that ODH has compiled. So I think it's, you know, I think one of the problems we run into is that we don't think necessarily that the problem uh, pertains to, uh, to, to you, right? Or to your patients. And is it worth the bother? And I, I would say that, you know, um, it, 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 if, if, if it's a high risk zip code, the law says that you need to do it. Right, next slide, please. Yeah, so I guess the take home point is that most of Ohio is high risk. So um, that's the, the end of, of me going on and on. Uh, what we were asking was just uh, to kind of rise everyone out of their torpor now. Um, uh, just a few polling questions in part to kind of feel like we're ever find out kind of where everybody is and then also uh, to use this to um, inform our next um, um, talk a little bit so um, the fir the first question and it, I wish I can read it what what what's your current level of confidence in discussing lead testing and follow-up and uh, there's like you know five levels and we know that some of these questions won't pertain to everyone, but this one should. <laughs> so just a quick question, Alex. You're taking care of the poll, right? I don't have to do anything. Okay, yes. there you go. Yes, yep, there you okay. go. All right, great. Okay, so it looks like the majority of people are confident. That's good, good. So we have it. And the next one. Um, so how, I mean, in your practices, like how often do you provide and discuss um, like lead exposure with, with families? I mean, some people are going to be, you know, depending on the makeup of your practice, you may be doing this pretty often or, or not often at all. All right, so that's good. Right. Looks like between monthly, it really varies, honestly. Um. And then the next, uh, just to talk about barriers, like what, what do you think is uh, you know, uh, a challenge to you to, to carry this out? And you can select as many as, as uh, are uh, applicable for you. Between all the questions. <laughs> okay. And, one more question. and then 
you know, what, what are, what are strengths that you currently have? Um, and this, uh, you can only select, uh, one thing. So, Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no worries. You just pick the one that you think is the most important to help you. So Alex, you're able to save these or whatever, so we can at least touch on yeah. some of the stuff uh, the next time. Yeah. All right, that was the last question. And now Dr. Newman and Dr. Bull will come on to answer any additional questions that you all have. You can just type those right into the chat box um, and then we will wrap up after that. Doesn't look like there's any questions um, right now, but if any so, questions. So, so I was always told, wait just like slightly longer than might be comfortable to see if anyone types <laughs> anything. We were, yeah. we, were, we were just discussing this at a, at a meeting. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, did it take the US 50 more years to ban paint in lead compared to Europe? Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Um, the, the ban in, in Europe didn't happen all like all at, at once, like in the 20s, but basically, um, you know, a lot of the, I mean, I think Yugoslavia, what used to be Yugoslavia, banned lead paint, like I think in 1926. So like, you know, the, it was pretty, um, you know, as countries were able to do it, they, they phased it, uh, you know, they they phased it out. And it's interesting because when you look at studies from those countries, the sources of lead are quite different than what uh, sources are here. And um, they, they also, and, and I hate to say, like, unfortunately, you know, uh, they, they went through you know, another world war that leveled like all these cities. So a lot of them were rebuilt, you know, using like more modern uh, materials too. So that was another like aspect of it. I'm, I'm not, recommending that as a way to deal with you know lead and housing but um you know that was the the, the reality of it yeah oh i was on mute sorry um, um so there's two questions do you, do you see yeah. that you want me to read them to you dr newman do you have yeah. any specific recommendations for certain immigrant populations um a lot they have a large indian population should we test certain immigrant groups more yeah so um i guess we'll probably both split this up i mean personally um i've seen uh, in the last year or so like um i mean almost i mean literally like dozens of of kids uh, referred to me because the, the lead levels were high and you know they live in newer housing and the and the source was a, a food product that was imported usually from India or um, uh, also like Ayurvedic medicines uh, have, been a, have been an issue, uh, Surma, like a lot of different things. So uh, I had a practice actually that, you know, they're in the suburb, like kind of exurbs, it's very, you know, all the stuff is like all new and they tested like one or two kids and now they send me patients all the time because they're just like, oh my gosh, like there's more and more and more. And I know uh, the folks from ODH have been really helpful with investigating these cases and get it, getting stuff figured out for the families. And, um, but it, it creates another level of, 
uh, anxiety too, because then they're like, well, how do I know that any of the food is okay? And I'm like, well, that's the problem because we don't routinely test it before someone gets ex exposed. So um, the- If I could add- cool. oh, Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Nick, I didn't mean to cut you. No, go ahead. Um, the only other thing I'd say, um, the question was about um, Indian immigrants. And I think from a prevention standpoint, it, um, it's also helpful to know that um, Nick mentioned a couple of the, the, the sources he's seen in his practice um, here in Cuyahoga County. Um, the sindoor or vermilion powder that is used in, in Indian cultures, like often as like a, a part of religious ceremonies um, and is a, has been a source of exposure for several cases here in Cuyahoga County. And the other um, is the coal or kajal that's often used um, it, for young children in South Asian cultures. Um, and then the uh, turmeric is a spice that sometimes has been implicated, especially if it's purchased internationally at open air markets by weight. It's a common sort of scenario. Um, I mentioned that uh, because not just from a testing standpoint, but just things to sort of cover with families that that Sindor powder should be out of reach of children, um, preferentially don't use it on babies. Um, be careful about that coal and kajal that we often use in South Asian cultures because it's often adulterated with lead. And so if the kids get their hands on it and eat it, it's a problem. So I, I do talk to families about that and about, you know, having, um, you know, preferring spices that are, um, that are, you know, not, not purchased abroad at an open air market. You know, I don't have a ton of families that do that, but I, but I do mention it. Um, and that these, um, some of these Ayurvedic or traditional remedies where the ingredients may not be transparent and you might not know what's in them to be careful about those too. The, the other thing I, I would, um, I'd give a little plug for our journal club because actually one of the, um, uh, the readings is actually about like these not, like uh, spices and other like traditional um, uh, remedies, et cetera, as a source of lead. There's a, a, a paper to read. Um, so uh, the question about uh, more background on the law requiring lead testing. Um, so yeah, I, um, I mean, all I can say is like, it's on the books. I'm not, uh, there is someone here from the Ohio Department of Health who might be able to, if he's still on, might be able to provide a little bit more detail if, if you would. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry, Nick, what, what would you like me to help with? Oh, one of the questions was, um, uh, they would love more background on the law requiring lead testing. Uh, we don't have a lab on site and it's hard, sometimes hard to convince families it's important to go get a blood drawn. And, and when you're done, I can talk a little bit about like other ways to try to do it in the, in the clinic potentially. Yeah, um, certainly a common uh, issue in getting children lead tested that we've been aware of. Um, you know, there are a couple options. Um, there are, of course, uh, CLIA waived instruments that can be purchased that can be utilized in the clinic, um, most notably lead care to um, devices and, and similar um, products in the same line that are meant to be uh, clinic based uh, tabletop instrumentation. Of course, then there is filter paper testing uh, where you can collect the sample uh, on what, what many refer to as a filter paper or filter paper card or paper card, and then send it off to a laboratory for analysis. And there are several options for that. Um, and I'm not sure if that's where you're going, Dr. Newman, but um, that would be you know two options. I know, Nick, you were going to speak a little bit more to the, to testing, but just um, I, I think the question was also kind of asking, I've, I've scrolled down now, I can't see it, but I think the question was like, can we just quickly review the legal requirements? Um, so just uh, jump in, Chris, if I get um, anything wrong here, but uh, so that legally uh, in Ohio, any child that's insured through Medicaid or lives in a high risk zip code or has a yes or I don't know answer to any of the, um, que the questionnaire uh, screening questions, needs to have their blood lead level checked, tested at 12 and 24 months, or at least once before the age of six. So if you see a kid that didn't have their, um, their recommended 12 and 24 month tests done, and they're four, for example, but then they fall into one of those categories, the law says you should test that child. Um, and I know Nick's going to talk a little bit more about in-office testing, 
um, it, when capillary testing is done, um, a, a positive test is, uh, needs to be confirmed uh, with a venous sample. So I think that's a simple way of summarizing what, what is required um, for us from a legal standpoint, um, but please jump in if I either missed or misstated anything. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, Chris touched on it, you know, a, the uh, filter paper and stuff, and uh, we have uh, some expertise down here uh, setting it up for our primary care clinics with Cincinnati children. So um, if someone has a question about that, you could, um, you know, send it back to Alex and then we could uh, try to reach out to you uh, around that. Um, the next question, are, are spices purchased at ethnic grocery stores a risk? Um, I, I'm going to respond with, you know, and, and I, I don't want to sound like alarmist, but like we, we've had items from almost any kind of store uh, come back positive with lead. And so um, you have to think a little bit about the, the supply chain for where the things are, are coming from. So like, um, you know, one, one of the pra practices that I've, I've found out about is that, you know, let's say, you know, you're a, a turmeric farmer and you're growing turmeric and it turns out that it's gotten, um, you know, some bugs have eaten their way into it. So if you're trying to sell that at the market, it doesn't look good. And it turns out if you put a little bit of lead chromate on it, that, has an orange yellowish color, it'll kind of cover up some of those blemishes. And apparently that's one of the ways that the, that the, the turmeric at least gets uh, contaminated. But the, um, there are multiple points along the way and, and that it could get involved. And, and there was a study done um, uh, by a group at Harvard uh, several years ago now that where they went out and they bought different spices and some of them were packaged in the US, some of them were from an ethnic grocery store, some of them were, and what they found was like, there was lead in all of them, um, you know, no matter where it was purchased, it really, it spoke to the fact that this was a problem that goes back through the supply chain. And um, we don't have um, really uh, the, the, the right kind of uh, standards around. In fact, there is no like, um, like particular standard for this. Like, uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a problem to be honest. I think you really want to say something about it. it. Just real quickly, I just want to underscore that, that as you mentioned, you know, in Ohio, you know, the vast majority of lead exposure occurs from housing related issues. So I, I'm not not to under. I mean, this is important. We should talk about it. And there are um, particular populations who may be using spices and traditional remedies that we don't want to forget about. Um, but I want to remind us that that's the that's the primary route of exposure for kids here. And the other thing, just to Nick's point about this being a regulatory problem in the food supply chain, just a, a note that there is some movement right now at the FDA um, around uh, setting standards related to heavy metals, especially in food that's marketed for babies and toddlers. But I'm certainly hopeful that this is a, they're venturing into territory that will allow a more of a proactive approach to testing um, and standards for all foods, including these commonly contaminated spices. And, and I included the link that I, I put in there is from uh, the North Carolina Healthy Homes Program. And they have, um, a very nice like fact sheet. I think they last updated it about like a year and a half ago, but it has like all these different uh, powders and things. So like, if you, I mean, I agree with the partner, like let's not like, you know, lose the forest for the trees here, but like the, um, I think, um, you know, it's, um, uh, to, to be honest, I mean, it speaks to the, I mean, the fact that um, lead is a very per pervasive toxicant and so um, it's in a lot of different items. Thank you. Are there any other questions that we can answer before we wrap up? Thank you everyone for the questions. Um,
just a reminder of some of the lead resources that we have available. We have the interactive lead website, the family lead rat card and the resource guide, as well as the lead toolkit and the journal club that I put links to register to in the chat box. If you haven't already um, registered, the lead toolkit will be released soon. Um, so it is an online format, like the picture I showed at the beginning, you can register. And there's tons of resources, um, literature, trainings, everything um, linked there on the toolkit. And then if you would like credit for MOC or CME, um, the article of the month that Dr. Newman referred to with a lot of articles that Dr. Bull and Dr. Newman put together and uh, with different modules, can you can register for that as well. And then if any questions come up, um, or if you would like additional information on anything that we talked about today, you can reach me via my email there. Second part of the training will be next Friday um, at 12, and we will go into more detail on some of the topics that were discussed. Thank you so much. And I will send the Zoom link out next week and information for certificates and things like that will also come out next week. If any questions come up, please send me an email and we look forward to seeing you all next week and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bull and Dr. Newman. Thank you again to ODH um, for their support. And we hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.